you all know that this is a, a, a big Latino community, a big percentage. What do you think the percentage of the Latino community would be here? You're pretty close to right on. It's 42 percent. And what do you feel? What do you think is probably the most famous Mexican holiday that we celebrate? Cinco de Mayo. And many people think that Cinco de Mayo is Mexican Independence Day, but it's not. And Dennis O'Leary is going to tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so. Uh, De Dennis has um, been an educator for over 27 years with the Oxnard School District. And after that, he didn't quit. He was on the Board of Trustees for another 14 years. He's now the District Director of LULAC. He was former. I was. Huh? Former. 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 But in his heart, he's always the director. <laughs> <laughs> so, they didn't listen to me then, and they don't listen to me now. So you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, so we're pleased he's going to talk to us about the Latino cu culture in um, Oxnard and how it affects us. So we can Thank you. Be Give him the microphone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no one can be away from the mic. Okay. Um, well, thank you for having me. And uh, I, first off, I have to say uh, I've only I, I feel like an outsider still. Uh, my, my wife and I moved here about 25 years ago. He was about one or two years old. And uh, we lived over actually at Surfside 4, just down the road here at the time. I loved it. Uh, we grew out of the place. We had two sons while we were there. We had to get something bigger. You know, so. uh, but I remember driving by this building even you know 25 years ago saying, it must look spectacular inside. This is the first time I've been inside. So thank you for inviting me. I, get, I got to see the salt and pepper shaker collection back here, uh, and a lot of the great photos. So, um, you know, it's interesting, because I, I, I was reading in some accounts there are 42, 45% Latinos in the community. Uh, I know I can talk to several friends who will tell me it's more like 75 percent. It's big, and that's part of the part of the issue. Um, when I got here, I'd already uh, lived. I'm originally from San Bernardino. Moved to a bunch of different places. Um, one of those places, by the way, well, let's see. The three famous people I grew up with. Uh, we were at a job corps center in Northern California. I'm buying a little time while he's finishing this up. Um, I was just a kid, and uh, my babysitter, I remember, was this young African-American guy, really tall, and he taught my brother and I how to box. Uh, George Foreman did very good for himself later on. My mother would say that uh, when he'd come over that uh, she would have to cook three chickens, one for the six of us and two for him. <laughs> uh, um, and uh, this was just before he went to the Olympics. He was still skinny at the time. Uh, then I moved to Minnesota, and I lived in Minneapolis for a few years. And years later, I'm an adult, my sister comes up to me and says, do you remember any of your friends in Minnesota? She, I'm the oldest in the family. And I said, yeah. I said, well, there was Daniel Boone, because how can you forget a name like that? And there was Roger Nelson. And she said, Roger, that's, he's, that's him, that's him. That's who? She said, do you have a picture? Yeah, I got a picture. Roger Nelson changed his name later on to Prince. Oh. And I do remember um, him once uh, in the basement of his house, handing me a guitar, and he was just learning the chords himself. And he was trying to teach me the chords. I've never learned how to play guitar. He did. <laughs> uh, and then, oh, we're about ready. Okay, I'll finish this up. My third person, I was in high school. I was the one white student in the, we called it, uh, we called it black history class. And the, the teacher was my counselor as well. He invited me here. And I was the only white kid in this classroom. This is in Rialto, California. And the first day of school, I walked in, I sat down, and about half the class were not that pleased that I was in there. And this one guy that I kind of knew of, I wasn't friends really just yet with him, he stood up. And I give him all the credit in the world. He, he looked at the other guys in the classroom. He says, no, you'd be mad at you know, all the guys outside the classroom. Dennis is here. He looked at me and he said, 
I'm going to be your bodyguard. Well, I don't think he had to be my bodyguard, but Ronnie Lott of the San Francisco 49ers did very good for himself. So, you know, so the three the three people I grew up with that made a name for themselves, they were all African-American leaders in their own right. It was kind of curious. Okay, Cinco de Mayo. Uh, no, it's not Mexican Independence Day. And the joke is that when you go to Mexico, uh, it's kind of like, uh, well, the name O'Leary. You know, I've always been told, uh, if you go to Ireland for St. Patrick's Day, up until a few years ago, you would basically go to church. And only in the last few years, there's parades and what, because they figured out that the American tourists want to see a parade. Uh, Cinco de Mayo is kind of the same. If you go to Mexico, they don't quite know what, what, what it is. And I got this one 30 second clip I wanted to show. Uh, I just hit play some. Yep. This is my son, Dominic. Hello. Hey, Dominic. Oh, that wasn't the. Will you hit the sun? Hit the sun? Let me brag, in two months, if everything goes as planned, my son is going to be a Peace Corps volunteer in Togo, Africa for the next 27 months. What part of Africa? Just let him run the computer. What, what part of Africa? Togo, Africa. Oh, Togo, West okay. Africa. West Africa. I, I heard that uh, Trump was going to throw out the Peace Corps. I, I'm, I haven't heard that, but I kind of went to yeah, kind of wondering if he might. <laughs> we don't like peace, I don't know, so. Um. No, he doesn't like peace. <laughs> my wife would be very happy if my son is returned, by the way. <laughs> how did you get Togo? How, uh, how did you get Togo? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the way it works. Perna only spent three days uh, setting those up for it. Yes. So don't screw it up. Just my, my little minor technical <laughs> oh, the so the way it works, um, you apply with the government, you send your resume, and like the government, you can say, I prefer a certain region. And He's they'll fluent say, in Spanish, by the way. I'm fluent in Spanish, so I selected Central South America. Uh, being the government, they said, okay, that's fine, but we want you here. Do you want to go? Uh, so that was my choice. So I said yes. And they uh, speak French in Togo. They speak French, a uh, former, former French colony. And they said, oh, it should be easy enough for you to learn. I didn't know too much about Togo, um, but a few months of researching it in. So it's a very interesting history and background. Maybe when I can come back, I can give you a first-hand account of it a little more. And I, I got on the internet and thought, okay, I want to see what Togo League's food is like. So I punched in Togo restaurants and I got all these sandwich shops. Because there's a Togo sandwich shop everywhere. So yeah, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't think that's a Togo League's food. The video's going to play down here. Um, okay. It might take me there a few minutes to get up there. So well, if, if, it, if you can't get in the next 60 seconds, we'll go on. I, I, I have a video. Uh, one of the things, and I have actually taught uh, Chicano Studies classes uh, from junior high, high school, and even college classes. And one of the things I've, I've always wanted, there's one movie. How many of you remember sitting in the theater maybe watching the movie Born in East L.A.? You know, and I've always said that that movie, I want to make a semester out of that movie. And there's this one scene that, uh, if we can show you, maybe not, that they at the very end of the movie and they're coming up through this manhole cover in the middle of the street in Los Angeles. Uh, the guy who was an American and his Mexican girlfriend he met in his adventures. And they come up through the manhole and there's a parade going on. Uh, oh, here we go. Okay. Hit play, please. I 
and and I, I just I saw that clip and I said I got to show that because if you talk to Mexicans, if I work quite closely with Mexican consulates, they know what the single divide is. But most Mexicans will probably have the same response: What is single divide? Because it's it's more of a it's celebrated in the city of Puebla, Mexico. It's not really considered a national holiday. Um, okay. Just hit the arrow. The arrow? Okay, this space one. So, Mexico is actually uh, gained its independence in 1810 from the Spaniards. 16th of September, that is their independence day. So, if you're wondering why they, why the Mexicans in our community seem to have celebrations all the time, well, this is the actual independence day. And they won't be out there celebrating this day. Cinco de Mayo is kind of the American Mexican thing. Um, so it goes back. Let's see. It go. It it basically had to get started a few years before Cinco de Mayo. Uh, the Mexican American War was fought between the United States and Mexico uh, between 1846 and 1848, uh, and. United States won. Mexico, in the process of battling this war, had to get loans. And they got loans mainly from three countries, Spain, France, and England. Well, Mexico uh, lost the war. They lost quite a bit of territory to the United States, including California, by the way. And um, and they had these loans to these major European countries. Now, particularly France. France was, at that time, the most powerful country in the world. Right. And France hadn't really suffered a defeat for at least 50 years at this point. Um, so you had a few years after this, this is 1848. Oops, that button. Uh, you had, going a few years after the Mexican-American War, you had two presidents in Mexico. And they called it, you had the liberal president and you had the conservative president. Basically, Mexico was in a cold civil war. And the conservative president was situated in Mexico City. The liberal president was the first indigenous president in Mexico by the name of Benito Juarez. And he was in the coast at, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name now, uh, San, I'll get the name of the capital. Uh, but these loans were made mainly to the conservative groups. Most of Europe recognized a conservative president. The United States recognized Benito Juarez. So that's shortly after the Mexican-American War. San Juan, Puerto Rico? No. No. That's above Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so you have basically uh, running battles now within Mexico, within Mexican forces and cities. The central part of Mexico was considered conservative. The outskirts, north and south, were liberal. And it was a, basically a guerrilla war that was going on for several years. Benito Juarez was recognized by the United States as the legitimate president. Uh, and he uh, basically was an outsider still. Uh, in this process, he finally did, his forces did take over Mexico City. So he basically won that skirmish, that part of the Civil War. Well, then came the matter of those loans. And one thing that Benito Juarez had to do was he had to basically send a message to the three countries that he was going to freeze the payments of the loans for two years. Because Mexico, you know, was economically, they were ruined from the war and then also from their internal civil war. And 
At that time, you had Queen Victoria of England, Queen Isabella of Spain, and Napoleon III of France. The three countries sent uh, ships to Mexico to help negotiate. And back then, unlike today, I think, back then, uh, they were, if, if you didn't pay on the loan, they were going to take it. In fact, there was loans also to the United States before the Mexican-American War, and we decided, the United States, that uh, we negotiated reparations that we would take profits from the mining in Mexico. And there's quite a bit of uh, silver deposits in Mexico, amongst other things. And so that the United States, we kind of worked it off on the side. But France in particular, they saw an opportunity. Spain and, uh, Spain and England basically returned to their countries, and they were going to abide that in two years they could start receiving payments. France, on the other hand, we all grew up learning about the Louisiana Purchase from France, right? They're seeing this territory in the United States. And by the way, what was happening in the United States around 1860? Our Civil War. Now France, it's, it's interesting. Uh, in researching this, you get all kinds of different possibilities. And I'm trying to pick the ones that I think are probably more possibly correct. Uh, France was rooting for the Confederates because tobacco and cotton were big in Europe and in France and if they could help the Confederates win they could have cheaper tobacco and cotton and everything else. They didn't mind the slavery part. The other thing was that France noticed that gold had been discovered in California. And the idea was that the vein of gold might run down into Mexico as well. And so France was looking at a lot of profit from this country that was saying they weren't going to make payments. Uh, there was an opportunity. Well, they cost a hundred dollars then. <laughs> they paid um, it in gold. <laughs> actually, the city where Benito Juarez was located, Veracruz, Mexico. This is it. And it's off the coast of central Mexico in the Caribbean. This is where Benito Juarez was situated, where the liberals had control. And the French started off with a barricade to block any other shipments into Mexico. Uh, they felt that Mexico was basically destroyed internally. France, again, was the most powerful military in the world at the time. And they didn't expect that it would take much to defeat the Mexican government. Uh, then also from Veracruz, it's a short distance to Mexico City. There's one problem, there's one city in between called Puebla, and this is what we're talking about today. So after a couple months, the French send in and I've read everywhere from six to 8,000 soldiers. Okay. Uh, they send, let's say, 6,000 soldiers to make an incursion on Mexico City. They thought that Mexico would basically fall, uh, just for their being present. Oh, okay. Some of the reasons uh, they were interested in continuing slavery in the United States. They were, the eye was more towards the United States than it was Mexico, I truly believe. White, white and black slavery. Sure. Um, gold had been discovered in California not too many years before. And the United States was too occupied to send reinforcements down to Mexico to fight the French. In fact, I read different accounts that both the North and the Confederates at some points actually talked about stopping the Civil War so they could both together go down and fight the French. There was actually talk about doing that. 
which just goes to prove that even back then, everybody hated the French. You know? um, naturally, that didn't happen. And the French knew that the United States was basically too occupied to bother. They, they figured it was a pretty clean shot to take the Mexican government. By the way, so this is the uniformed soldiers in Mexico. Uh, this is pretty much what they might have looked like at the time. A lot of the, uh, to the surprise of the French, a lot of the soldiers were basically just uh, indigenous farm workers, you know, the people basically Pancho, rose up. Pancho Villa. That came a little bit later, but yes. These are the French soldiers, and back then, people still marched in lines, and uh, you uh, basically, you know, uh, did the military uh, objectives just like you would write on a piece of paper. Uh, guerrilla warfare started both in Mexico and in the Civil War in the United States at this time, but the French, they were classic European. Uh, let's send the formations up and start shooting. Yeah, aren't these uniforms great? I don't know how practical they are. You can see them from about 10 miles away, right? So the French, they found Puebla, Mexico. And in Puebla, uh, this again was the, uh, the liberal capital of the country. And it also had two forts on hills. So its defense was the high ground in Puebla. And particularly Fort Guadalupe was very well armed. You had uh, Fort uh, Loreto as well. And the French actually did cause quite a bit of uh, casualties in their first attack. Uh, but again, what was happening was the people of Puebla also took arms. That was not expected. And so in the first round, because the Mexican soldiers, there were only about 2,000 Mexican soldiers there at the time, they had the high ground. They had cannons. And so they were able to repel the French. The French retreated, and then a, the next day came back. The next day they came back attacking Fort Guadalupe, and also trying to go into the city of Puebla as well. Well, they had a lot of problems with that. Number one, uh, the people had taken arms. The French were not used to guerrilla warfare. They had never seen it before. The other thing that happened was prudential reign. Have you ever heard the phrase of keep your powder dry? The French, their powder got wet. And so all of a sudden, the French, they suffered about four or 500 casualties, and they retreated. The, the Mexican soldiers, by the way, did suffer about 200 casualties. So, you know, there were casualties on both sides, but the French powder got wet. And all of a sudden, if they wanted to fight, it had to be hand to hand. They repelled the French. The French that went back to the coast. And from that day, Benito Juarez, the president that was stationed in the city, in Veracruz, in this region, he proclaimed Cinco de Mayo, the 5th of May, as a national holiday. <laughs> kind of like, remember the Alamo, except in this case, the people are remembering one. Now have you, a year later, France mounted more soldiers and basically went around Puebla. So the French actually did take over. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry. This is the this was the general in charge of the fort at Guadalupe. And his name was Ignacio Zaragoza. He's considered a patriot, a hero in Mexico. He died of yellow fever a couple months afterwards. He was in his 20s, a very young man. Uh, so he's considered a national hero. Had he lived, he, 
might have been president himself someday. But uh, uh, again, you, you basically, your general was in his 20s at the time. And it worked, so, you know, he's uh, praised to this day. Some photographs, uh, again, uh, I'm not, this seems very romantic, doesn't it? Um, but, uh, but the forts were on the high ground, which is the big thing. And again, they don't talk about it much. The Mexicans, even if I speak to people at the consulate, uh, they, they like to say how they beat the French. They don't want to mention that the rain came and turned everything to mud and turned the, the, the gunpowder to you know, slushies. They, they don't want to mention that part. But everything in war, everything counts, right? Uh, Benito Juarez immediately called Cinco de Mayo a national holiday, and this was a rallying cry. Now, have you, the French did take over part of the country, and they were actually, Mexico was a French imperial colony for several years. But in regions, you know, Cinco de Mayo was the, the war cry, because the Mexicans actually did defeat the French at one point, so they're trying to remind the communities. The United States, uh, we supported the Mexican government. We were too busy at the time. We, we had our hands full ourselves. And the French sent in an Austrian duke to become Maximilian the first of Mexico, the king of Mexico. Mexico had a royal family. Uh, Carlota was his queen, and uh, you might recognize part of this Mexican flag. This is the imperial flag of Mexico. Interesting, huh? So, Cinco de Mayo, you know, they won the battle, they lost the war, at least up until that point. Uh, the central part of Mexico became an imperial colony. Benito Juarez was still considered the president of Mexico by the United States. Most European countries recognize the, uh, the king of Mexico. We used a yellow flag with a rattlesnake, do not tread on me. I don't think they, he would have been, if, it, if somebody came and come up with the idea, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I'm saying that's what we used, you know, mm -hmm. during the Civil War. And, you know, and their Civil War, you know, uh, it might have been for different reasons, but it was just as complicated as ours, I think, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, President Juarez and Abraham Lincoln did exchange, actually, many letters to each other. They never met. Uh, had Lincoln not been assassinated, they probably would have met later on in life. Uh, but uh, they were very similar in a lot of their ideas and their thoughts. Yeah, he was raised very poor in Virginia, and he did his homework with coal and a shovel. That's how he did his homework. True. And Bernie Juarez was the first indigenous president to Mexico, basically came up from poverty as well. So, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of see that they probably could have been very good friends. Uh, but they did exchange well, I'm, I'm quite sure a bit of are in heaven. I'm sure they are in heaven. <laughs> so, you recognize the, the map of Mexico. The center part here in the blue, this is basically what was controlled by the French Empire. And you have to the north and south that they did not control. And so you basically had a stalemate civil war with running battles going on periodically. Where, where does Albert Pike come in this? General, I'm not sure. General Albert Pike was involved in the Civil War too. Well, that was, but the American War, right? was he in Mexico? Yeah. Uh, probably the later, oh, was, I'm going to cover Sheraton and I'm, I'm not sure. U.S. I mean, he was in the West or something, in the well, Midwest or something, yeah. Why, why don't we hold the questions until the end, okay? Well, they come up. I'm trying to put the pieces together. Now, the, uh, the Cinco de Mayo, the Battle of Puebla, happened in 1861. Finally, uh, this is towards the end of the reign of, uh, of Maximiliano, the United States Civil War finally ran down to an end. And 
President Lincoln was sending, let's see, get the names here, U.S. Grant and uh, General uh, Philip Henry uh, Sheridan to go to the Mexican border. They were ready to stage the war. Now, what was happening was the French never expected to have the resistance in Mexico that they found. They thought they were going to be able to take the country, you know, very easily. Isn't it interesting that superpowers, including the United States, we always think that the, the small, weak country is just going to roll over? And bottom line is everybody's patriotic to their country. Um, the French saw that the United States was not distracted by the Civil War anymore. Uh, the French also saw that they had a very difficult time in France, in, in Mexico, and uh, Na Napoleon III actually wrote to the King of Mexico, Maximiliano, asking him to advocate. And so that was kind of the beginning of the end, because if you're a Mexican soldier fighting for the French, and you see that the power has just been taken away, a lot of people you know, a lot of the soldiers also stepped aside. Uh, the Civil War continued for a couple more years. Uh, and finally, towards the end, Carlota, the, the queen, went to Europe to beg any country to come and support her husband in Mexico. And it said that uh, she went crazy. It said that she actually visited the Vatican and pleaded with the Pope, finally, to, to come. And to this day, and apparently this is true, she is the first and only woman who has spent the night in the Pope's chambers as an official, official guest. He saw that she was mentally so distraught that they asked her to stay. And she lived there, apparently, for a couple of years in, in the Pope's chambers. Um, she never saw her husband again. He uh, continued to fight for his power. And in one battle, he and two generals were captured in a skirmish outside Mexico City. Uh, they were executed. And uh, Maximiliano, they say, in front of the firing squad, number one, asked that mariachi music be played before he was shot. He was so enamored with, with the history of Mexico and what. And so they had a ballad of the Swallows, uh, La Cancion de las Golondrinas. Uh, they played that before he was shot. He also asked that he not be shot in the, in the face because he wanted his mother to recognize his body. And they say that, you know, they fulfilled his wish. <coughs> Uh, his body was returned several years later to Europe, so I don't know how much was recognized, but anyway. Benito Juarez became the legitimate president of all of Mexico after that, and uh, continued for five more years after the fall of the uh, French. Now, Mexico was in a state of flux all this time. They had internal civil unrest. They had an invading force coming in. They had Benito Juarez, who even though he was the victor, at least half the country didn't really support him. And I guess, how do you balance out history? Well, in this case, in Mexico, uh, right after Benito Juarez, they had President Porfirio Diaz, who was a general at the time fighting the French, he became basically a de facto dictator. And for 30 years, minus five in between, uh, there were five years, one, uh, once, one section of one year and then another president for four years that kind of fit in between him. But for 30 years, he was basically the dictator in Mexico. That's where he gets up to the rebellions of Zabata and Pancho Villa and what, that finally brought Mexico maybe back to the center in, in politics again. But uh, so it, it, it makes sense in a way that unfortunately sometimes you need a strong, a strong man like this to get a civil unrest under control. 
and then believe me, politics in Mexico today. I today quite often I have people telling me, well, all Mexicans are Democrats and all Mexicans vote this way. And I look at them and said, do you understand how many political parties are in Mexico? Uh, they don't have two. They might have twenty. You know, and even within the parties, there's you know. So, you know, but uh, he was the strong man that brought Mexico back to basically democracy, even though that came after his fall again, that they could have free elections and what. Now, Cinco de Mayo here in California or in the United States, there's all kinds of theories. The one that historically I think I trust the most is, you know, why do we celebrate Cinco de Mayo here? It actually, you know, your first answer could be beer companies and advertising and avocados and you know kids, college students and you know that's and, and yes that came into play. But in 1970, there was the Chicano Moratorium. Has anybody ever heard of the Chicano Moratorium? A couple people. In 1970, in Los Angeles, there was a protest called the Chicano Moratorium. Thousands of Mexican Americans went to the streets and they were protesting the Vietnam War. What year the, was that? 1970. Okay. And the, the simple fact is that they were noticing that even though they were 10% of the soldiers going to war, 20% of the fatalities coming back were Mexican American. And, you know, just like a lot of other groups in the United States are saying, hey, you know, something needs to be changed and this needs to be pointed out. Now, during this protest, the first two or three hours, there were no problems. But there was word of looting in a store. And I say word of looting, to this day I can't find where that looting happened. But there was word of looting in a store. And because of that, the police department basically ascended on the protest. What are your boulevard around Ford Avenue? <laughs> Silver Dollar Bar. Um, and um, four people were killed, 60 people were injured, 200 people were arrested. One of the four people that were killed was a newspaper writer for the LA Times, uh, Ruben Salazar. And Ruben Salazar was basically the only Mexican American or Chicano at the time that was writing about the community's issues in a mainstream newspaper, the LA Times. He was in the Silver Dollar Bar, and the official report is that he was killed because a tear, cap, tear gas canister struck him in the head while he was in the bar. Well, apparently this particular bar had the door, it had a wall, it had, basically the tear gas canister would have had to bounce off about four different walls to be able to hit him and physically the autopsy showed that there was no injury to his head. So we may never know. But this was in 1970 in the United States. The Chicano movement at that time proclaimed that Cinco de Mayo was a good rallying cry. And so they knew that it was a celebration of a battle in Mexico, and the Chicano movement decided to use that as a rally cry in the United States. Now, it's fuzzy. I can't swear that that's the only reason. Shortly after, of all people, Coors Beer decided that they were going to advertise. You, 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 you knew about that one, right? Coors Beer started some advertising, and one of the first single to mile celebrations in the United States was in Denver, Colorado, well, that's where Coors Beer is from. So, you know, why didn't we celebrate single to mile in the United States? There probably are a few people from Puebla, Mexico that are here that grew up learning about the battle. There are maybe even a couple Chicanos around that remember, you know, the good old days in the 70s and the Vietnam protests. Most people will probably point at first the American beer companies and then after a while the Mexican beer companies said, hey, we might as well get on, in on it too. And it seems to be advertising generated more than anything else. Uh, I was the one that wired Bush Gardens and they, you know, everybody forgot about okay. that one. 
And now I and, and Bush is, and that's that's my that's my video presentation. Are there any comments or questions? And, and have you? I am not the expert on Cinco de Mayo, so hopefully maybe you have some points that you bring into this as well. Yes. The question I have is like, okay, so in the Civil War, I mean in the Revolutionary War, France was supporting the United States. <coughs> Correct. And then in this war now. The United States is probably not supporting France, and the other countries were. How did this? And then we had just gotten into a war with Mexico, you know, a few years back. For sure. So how, did, how did we repair relations with Mexico, and then also be enemies with France when they kind of supported us? You know, the, revolution? the, the, the Mexican-American War. Uh, about seven or eight years ago, I was invited by the Mexican government to go to Mexico City. It's the only time I've ever been to Mexico other than Tijuana when I was a kid. And even in Mexico, they tell me that doesn't count. Um, and uh, so uh, we were there to talk about education in the United States. And I spent uh, four days basically in the ministry department, and quite often in a room with no windows. Now, if you're in an industry department in a large room with no windows, you can only imagine that's probably where a lot of things get done, too. Sure. One evening, we went to a museum just outside of the Capitol building there. And uh, they were having a little reception for, for us. We were about 20 educators from Canada and the United States. And there's this glass box on a pedestal. And there was this book that was open, and it had a bunch of black seals and ribbons hanging down from it and what. And so one gentleman, he was from Arizona, and I'll tell you why I remember that in a second. He and I are looking at this, and he calls over the dozier, he says, what is this? Now I remember that about six, seven, eight years ago, Arizona was in the middle of uh, their Ma 1047, I think it was, which basically they could stop anybody if you appeared to be Latino. And um, the Dozier looked and said, oh, that's a Treaty of Guadalupe. That's our copy. Well, the United States signed a treaty with Mexico at the end of the Mexican-American War. And the United States got the territory. But we promised that Mexican citizens could keep their property, they could keep their culture, and they could keep their language. We kind of reneged on all three of those, by the way. And so I remember the, the friend from Arizona, he said, can I borrow this? I'll give it back to you. I just want to take it to Arizona and show a few people, you know. Uh, that's why I remember he was from Arizona. Um, we, you know, we, we fought Mexico, we got our territory. I don't think the United States saw Mexico as a threat. But France, on the other hand, was, you know, the United States, number one, going into the Civil War, we were a very weak country compared to other countries in, in the world, and especially Europe. France was number one. With the Civil War, you know, we devastated our military, even on the ground as it was. So even though we did send in troops at the border of Mexico to say, hey, we're willing to support you, uh, the United States was more fearful of France than they ever could, would be of Mexico. I think, that's, I think that's what happened. The good news was, France wasn't willing to put up a fight at that point because they, they never believed that the people power, that the guerrilla warfare would come about. And, uh, and they, France, I think, wanted to save face, probably. Yes. <laughs> the French got involved in, the, in our revolution as a method of countering the English. It was a, it was a marriage of convenience. Uh, uh, the enemy of my enemy is my enemy. Yeah. And, and the old joke, everybody hates the French. Mm. Sorry, but anybody a French heritage here? I apologize. Well, the Rashos in California, they stayed next to the Mexican land and stuff like that, stayed for a while. For a while, but eventually, you know, well, once... sold them, and who knows? Them. Right. <laughs> um, you know, and then over time, just things happen. Uh, the, the local history with Cesar Chavez, uh, his family, he was born in Yuma, Arizona. His grandparents owned land that was, he was, during the Depression, they were basically swindled out of the, out of the land. And that's when the family came to Oxnard. 
to, uh, to start working. Uh, so yeah, over time, we just kind of picked apart, you know, properties. Yes? Um, I grew up with Henry Hernandez. He was one of my best, his family owned horses down in the river bed of the Ohana River where I grew up. Uh -huh. Between the Chicanos, uh, East LA, Pig Rivera. I went to school with uh, the, the actor named John, uh, the Scarface. Mm -hmm. He graduated Montevallo High ahead of me. Uh, but I'm going to find out some of the answer, questions that you have. Like, I, I, I remember a lot of things on Olympic Boulevard, you know, happened in that Weir Boulevard. And uh, Pico Pico Ranch is one of the places I wired. Uh, they ra he raced horses, uh, and that's how he won his land. And they, to this day, where the Hernandez is on the land, every all the Mexicans live down there now. Sure. The chickens and, and, and ducks and and even with the, you know, and and you get to the point where Dennis O'Leary, you know, I've been I'm not friendly, but I've been as a director of LAC, which is the League of United Latin, Latin American Citizens, uh, the oldest civil rights organization in the country for Latinos. I've taken up other Latino houses. I'm not Latino. And uh, and in discussions with people, even who are legitimately Mexican or Latino, or they will debate the them amongst themselves. We don't know today where everything is in flux as far as the history. Particularly, you can imagine, as we're sitting and standing now with Donald Trump in the White House, People are looking around at each other saying, what do we do if? And that if might be 24 hours from now. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting time we're in. David, David, yes. David Emanuel and Peter Marshall wrote a book called uh, About America. Then it went on to the Civil War, and uh, they researched all their stuff. Uh, you know, like uh, a lot of things weren't researched. They made books that were half-truths until they, they came along. It, and they started writing about Vietnam, what it was like 15 years before. And uh, that's The Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall and David Madden. Mm -hmm. And they went out to the American Indians that were as old as 115 <coughs> years old and asked them what it was all about. And they began whatever, you know, what, what they had for to collect the information then uh, was telephone lines. And we live in a time where we're talking about <coughs> real news and fake news. So and this, can you imagine trying to describe history? Yeah, the Civil War. You know, they, we they, see they, things actually happening all, in front in of the us. Korean, and disagree with in the other. Korean bookstores are online. You can find mm -hmm. Peter Marshall and David Manuel's books, and they're all true. Yeah. Question. Like, Blue Light. How is Blue Light coordinated? I know, like, in the, in the 70s, I remember going to college, they had, like, they had Mapa, and then they had a couple of other Correct. Um, Latino support mm -hmm. organizations. How was the evolution, like Hulak actually was, I mean, I learned about that later, but I remember mm -hmm. often there was one other organization. Yeah, that they asked huh? the Chicanos, they asked them. I'm and sure. And they had all, and how would they, how would that whole, you know, uh, coordination emerge? Like, like inviting relatives to a Thanksgiving dinner, you know, they, they all agree that they're going to get together, but they disagree on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of organizations out there. And uh, Hulak is the oldest, uh, Latino organization that's still in existence. Uh, MAPA and MALDEF came from LULAC, kind of offsperts of LULAC. But uh, there are coordinations and uh, different focuses sometimes. Uh, MALDEF is more of the legal, you know, uh, they sue people, that's the general joke. Uh, LULAC calls MALDEF to sue people, you know what I'm saying? Uh, within LULAC, there's a national organization uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C. Uh, the, uh, the CEO of LULAC is a good white Irishman by the name of Britt Wilkes, and he's been in that position for many years. So uh, there are African Americans, there's Indians, there's uh, any mix you can think of. LULAC, uh, it depends on the region. Uh, you know, I'll go to national conventions in LULAC. And it's very interesting that a Floridian Latino is much different than a Californian Latino, and nobody is like a Texan Latino. I mean, it's, 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 uh, so you know this idea that everybody's the same—that uh, gets blown out of the water real fast. 
I do remember one time, I share a short story, I was at a national convention in, uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, for LULAC. And there was, you know, these conventions will have 15, 20,000 people. And I was talking to a gentleman, the military is also very strong in LULAC and a few of these organizations. And I was talking to this gentleman who had his Medal of Valor on his neck, which, you know, I, I never served in the military. Uh, Vietnam ended when I was about 13 or 14, so I was close enough to say, hey, in a couple more years, but far enough away, thank God I didn't have to do that. But uh, I, I, I know the, the value of that medal that he was wearing. And I was talking to him in a hallway, and somebody came running into the hallway saying that the KKK was outside the convention center saying that everybody inside was illegal. And I'm talking to a gentleman with a Medal of Valor <coughs> hanging from his neck. And, you know, I just, I, th there's certain moments you just remember. And our conversation, he and I, you know, changed at that moment and said, should we go outside? And I'm thinking, oh, let's please do it so they can see your, your medal. You know. Well, he was correct. He said, no. He said, I'm going to stay in here. And he was an elderly gentleman. But he said, uh, it wasn't, you know, them seeing that medal was not going to change what they were saying or what they were doing. Uh, so that stuff still exists. Um, but uh, just like any organization, uh, you know, uh, if you want to see democracy in action, do not go to a LULAC national election, believe me. Uh, because everybody there is a chief and there's no, there's no soldiers, you know, so uh, there's more arguing than I've ever seen. It's kind of embarrassing sometimes. But, uh, but the organizations exist. Unfortunately, a lot of, in this case, Latinos, uh, the youth, they don't know about these organizations. Or they might know that there's a Mecha at their school, but they, but they think that Mecha is basically where they have a monthly party. And so a lot of this history of why these organizations are around has kind of fallen off. But that's always going to be the case with any population, probably. But there are a lot of good people still fighting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. I would like to give you, uh, this is Wainini Stories and Wainini Stories 2. These are, uh, I love this. that uh, Dorothy Ramirez and Helen Brandt put together along with some of the Mirandas. And they are really fun to listen to from talking about the pigs on the beach to Red Box George and things like that. You know, in, in fact, uh, I want to see these, but I can see where I can probably use these in my classes also. Oh, they're great. Right. When I first moved to the area, I thought the name was Wainini. Oh. 